Geek Myths, a novel about life, love, and the pursuit of sonic screwdrivers. Available in paperback and Kindle edition from Amazon. Scanning for audio. Welcome, welcome to It's In Dog Podcast. Now, this is number three in the ever-popular 20-episode-long strand of the Tin Dog Podcast that, for some godforsaken reason, we're calling 2020 Hound Sight. It made sense at the time and was hilarious. It wasn't hilarious at all. But, you know, that's what we called it and that's what we went for and that's what's happened. So, in between our last story, Winter for the Adept, and this one which is Blood Tide, we've had several releases. Here's a recording of me reading out the list and chatting about them while I'm not driving. Winter for the Adept was followed by The Apocalypse Element. More Dalek fun, finally. Fires of Vulcan, well, we all know how that ended up being almost repeated and brought back to us. uh, Well, you know, it's Volcano Day. Shadow of the Scourge, that's one of my favourites, one of my early introductions that one's got well it's got serverland playing i don't know a right wing leader in the uk (sighs) such thing is science fiction followed by what for a lot of people out there is a well a pivotal doctor who story it's the holy terror rod shaman produced a glorious piece of text and if you want to go back and just (laughs) some people out there really don't like frobisher from the cartoons right for from the comic strips they're wrong, and this story proves it. That's all you really need to know. Back to the Daleks again, with Nicholas Briggs writing and directing, and, well, another Dalek story. Taking us into 2001. Storm warning. We finally got the Eighth Doctor turning up, and this is where I join the game. I ask for this one on disc. Now, I'd already experienced the Marion Conspiracy, that's the very first uh, Sixth Doctor story, but I'd got that free at a, uh, the SFX convention in Blackpool, and I'd got given that on tape. I'd not really got around to listening to it. I was being a bit of a snob. I really was. But here we had the Eighth Doctor turning up. The Eighth Doctor. Oh, yes, it was all going to be all right. Perhaps I could just convince myself that if I just pop into Big Finish and just listen to this first disc, and I convinced my girlfriend at the time to give me this as a present for Christmas, I believe. Or perhaps a birthday. It makes sense. It looks like it's the second release, so probably a birthday present. Anyway, this is Storm Warning. This is the eighth Doctor turning up. This is the proper current Doctor. The thing is, I loved it so much, my addiction starts here. But then, of course, you've got the next story. Sword of Orion, more Eighth Doctor. The Stones of Venice, more Eighth Doctor. Minuet in Hell, more Eighth Doctor. They're building, they're growing, and there's quite a lot of them. Minuet in Hell, it's a whole season of Eighth Doctor. Loop Guru. Now, that's a werewolf story with Turlo. I know Turlo, we haven't had Turlo for ages. And then Dust Breeding, where you've got Ace, Bev, and the Master. All written by Mike Tucker. The Master. And this was meant to be the Anthony Ainley story. But of course, Ainley just eventually, well, really, really wasn't available. As opposed to just going, I can't do it. Some people say he asked for too much money. Some people just say he wasn't available. Uh, Some people just say other things. Which brings us to the story I'm going to talk about now. Release number 22. Blood Tide. Directed by Gary Russell. Written by Jonathan Morris. It's the Sixth Doctor and Evelyn. We've had a handful of Evelyn stories, and I'll be talking about those while I drive. Notice the smooth and almost unnoticeable change in sound quality. Blood Tide was brilliant. I mean, let's face it. You've got Evelyn, who... Ah, now. 
You have to remember that at the time, we're still in the realm of, oh, I didn't like the sixth Doctor on telly. Some of us were growing up and experienced the wrong things. Now, my love for the sixth Doctor is great. There are many reasons for this, but one of them involves a piece of technology called Betamax. I know, Betamax, the superior of the home recording systems. VHS was cheaper, but the quality was better on Betamax. Now, the problem with Betamax is that when you put the tape in, it spooled it around all of the heads. And then that was prone to wear and ageing. But you did get a better quality recording and playback. We liked Betamax in our house. Betamax was not going to live. But this was during the beginning of the great VHS Betamax war. And of course, as always, I choose the losing side. I always do. It's kind of a personality trait of mine. If you want to know who's going to lose in a battle of technology, ask me, because I'm the one who's done the research and found out that the one I prefer is the better system, but the one that's doomed to failure. And the only exception to this, of course, is my dislike of Apple products. But let's not go there. That's an entirely different conversation for an entirely different time. So, what have we got? We've got me watching The Sixth Doctor on TV. This is back in the 80s, yeah? And I get a Betamax recorder. I get it halfway through the season before Trial of a Time Lord. This is Colin's first season. Remember, we had the one story on TV with Colin where he was playing the part of... a not particularly nice Doctor because he wanted a story arc, similar to the Capaldi thing, where he wasn't very nice and at the end you loved him, okay? Which was a great plan if he'd stayed in the role for five, six years, which was his plan, yeah? Uh, At least he wanted to do more than a season and a bit. Two seasons and a bit. Yeah? Makes sense? Right, so... Colin's first full proper season. We get the Betamax halfway through the season, just in time to record the story Time Lash. Yeah, Time Lash. So basically, I've got Time Lash and a Dalek story. And then for 18 months, there's no Doctor Who on TV at all. And I'm a kid, so I'm going to immerse myself in these stories. Which is why, unlike everybody else in the world, I quite like Time Lash. Yeah? I know. It makes me an odd little kettle of fish, but I like Time Lash. I like the Sixth Doctor in it. I like the whole Herbert thing. I'd really like Big Finish to have a whole Doctor and Herbert travel the world in a kind of a, the same, almost the same way that the Eighth Doctor and Mary Shelley do in their spin-off series. In fact, it would be very, very similar and probably not worth doing. But you could have him influencing all the stories and all of the other stuff, especially considering that Wells's work's now out of copyright. That's another story for another time. So, I like the Sixth Doctor. He's grown on me. I like the Dalek tales. I like everything because I watched those Betamax time and time and time again and wore them out. And yes, there are things wrong with Trial of a Time Lord. There are. I'm not going to lie. But I liked The Sixth Doctor because I had more exposure to this one than many others because there weren't any repeats of Ordinary Doctor Who on TV. And I couldn't afford new VHS because we didn't have a VHS player. See where I'm going with this? So, here we've got the largely disliked Sixth Doctor appearing in the one format that does the court the world of good. Audio. You just can't see it. In fact, there's a whole season where he's walking around in a lovely blue costume. Which I like to imagine is completely blue, and that's all. And yes, there's a reason for that which is incredibly sad. But we'll get to that one when we get to that one. Here we've got Evelyn. Ah, Maggie Stables. Never got to meet Maggie at a convention, and of course I never will now. She was brilliant. Yes, we experienced her in this particular run, in story number one, where she was going sand carved for no reason. Completely over the top. And you know what? You just can't tell. It's the same performance from the same actress. She's just superb. Marion Conspiracy is very good, and as I said, this was kind of my first one. Well, it's the f- because I got it on tape. I'm sure it's still in a cupboard somewhere. It's hardly a collector's item. Who's got tape players these days? Well, I admittedly, I had one in my last car until far past the date. 
uh, but that's me digressing. Really? There's a surprise. Anyway, so I've got this incredible story that I need to talk to you about now because Maggie Stables is brilliant. So you've got Colin, Sixth Doctor. You've got Maggie Stables, Evelyn Smythe. They're the Doctor and Companion. A lot of people put down how much they like Colin on audio to Maggie Stables character's influence. They made such a beautiful, wonderful, warm pair. She didn't take rubbish from him. She kept him in line. She, oh, It was just a really nice arrangement. It was like Margaret Rutherford in space. If you've not experienced any of these stories, again, this one, like the other ones, especially at the beginning of this ones that I'm reviewing, they're all about $2.99 to download. Utter bargains. Go for it now, seriously. So... Number three, in a 2001 run, for us, I would regale you with exciting things of going, hey, this bit of technology was out in 2001. Remember this? Don't you feel old now? You know what? We can all feel old on our own time. We really can. You don't need flashbacks going, hmm, the MP3 became really popular. Right? No, sod that. You don't want any of that. You don't want the rock and roll years of Doctor Who. Well, all right, maybe you do. We'll get round to those eventually. But that's not what we're talking about. Here, one story. So... You've got the Sixth Doctor, you've got Evelyn, and in this story, you've got the Silurians, I know, and you've got Darwin. It's Charles Darwin in an adventure with the Silurians. What's not to like? It's like somebody made a shopping list of cool stuff and went, oh yeah, evolution, oh yeah, the humans, oh yeah, the Silurians creating humans, it's all going to be all right. Big sections of this story take a lot from Doctor Who magazine's back few pages story about the Silurians and the way that they were taken out. Now, I don't know if this one was written by Alan Moore or not, but it did make a bit of an influence on me because this is my first, that was my first experience of the Silurians before I ever got around to seeing them on VHS. Admittedly, they'd appeared in a few of the new adventure books, but I wasn't really that aware of them, except for their appearance in Warriors on the Cheap because I was in UK, we didn't get the repeats, and so on. You know all this already. So they're kind of mythical creatures almost. I mean, it wasn't until I managed to track it down on VHS that I finally got to see the cave monsters. But by the time I'd heard this story, I was more than familiar with their work, who they were, what their motivations were, and everything. The Silurians are a great creature. They fit into that whole Malcolm Hulk thing of, well, the Doctor's stranded on Earth, which means that the aliens have to already be here. Hence the existence of the Silurians and the Sea Devils, and the new Silurians, and so on, and so on. Yes, Warriors on the Cheap does have a bad rep, but that's a TV story. You see, on audio, you don't have to put people in rubber costumes, so therefore the aliens look great. You've still got, at this point, none of the new series stuff, so no one's got a slightly Scottish brogue in the form of Madame Vastra. Silurians on audio had to sound like Silurians on TV. And the Silurians on TV that we had Warriors on the Deep and indeed in the Cave Monster, well, those ones, they had a wibbly voice. Which admittedly on TV is quite difficult to understand. You've really got to get your ear in. I mean, it's not been difficult, but it is quite hard. <laughs> Sir, what was that, Bane? You, you're here to kill everyone? Anyway, sorry. Okay, direct digressing again. Anyway, in this story, you've got your basic Charles Darwin investigating the Galapagos Islands because, as a present, the Doctor is going to introduce her Evelyn to Darwin, one of her heroes. Ideal. You've got the Voyage of the Beagle, but Evelyn has to not actually push Darwin into this. There is an intrinsic flaw in the entire storyline. Bear with me. Clearly someone had done their research and discovered that the Galapagos Islands was a penal colony, or at least a place for political prisoners. You see, as far as we're concerned, the whole place is kind of, well, just a nature reserve. We don't think of it as a place for people at all. But that's not quite the case, is it? Because historically speaking, it was a prison with a small colony of people there. Well, it's, you know, it's a, it's a series of islands. It's not just the Galapagos Island. It's the Galapagos Islands. You've got the different finches on the different islands, hence the whole evolution through natural selection thing. The flaw with the story is, is that we, 
as a human race in Doctor Who world were created by the Silurians as a slave slash food race, right? Which means that we're not the product of natural selection, we are the product of genetic engineering. So that has to kind of be danced around and moved over because, if, as Darwin discovers, if that's actually the case, that almost invalidates his theory. Great science fiction, lousy history, not good. The celebrity historical has always been a bit spurious. You see, my argument against them is that, is there anything that has happened on Earth that hasn't been guided or interfered with by the Doctor or some aliens? Again, great stories, but it makes you start to think, were we ever responsible for anything of our own making? Which keeps me up at night. Which it shouldn't, because I know, deep down, it's just a TV show. How dare you? I know. Right. So that's your basic story. Darwin investigates, the doctor turns up, some people are missing in the penal colony. We want to know where they're going. We do some more investigation, there's underground stuff. But then you've got, and it's great that I can talk about these things because it's 20 years ago, or 19 now, where you've got a power struggle between the Silurian factions. I mean, the whole story opens with the precap, a moment that happens beforehand, but the transition from the precap into the actual storyline is weird because of the crossfade. You don't know if the moments that's just happened happened 100,000 years ago or it happened immediately 10 minutes ago. It's not very clear. You do figure it out eventually with the storylines, but it's not as clear as it could have been. And perhaps there could have been something like showing that before the title sequence, but of course we don't want to be doing that. Remember, with this storyline, we're still, we're three years into this production and we're still listening to the 1970s version of the Doctor Who theme tune as the main theme for the productions. It's really quite strange. Now, I know that by the time we hit the next lot of, redu- of audios that we'll be talking about, and that's Neverland, right? Which totally weird. That's what we'll be talking about next time, but we'll be discussing the jump between 2001 and 2002 next time. We've got the Paul McGann theme tune, so I'm pretty sure we've got a fade out of all of the more weird Doctor Who storylines. I did want to set about putting all of the proper theme tunes into the proper bits of Doctor Who. It's not worth it, really, is it? All right, it is. You know it is, but that's not important. What is important right now is that with this particular storyline, you've got a lovely, lovely unfolding narrative. Yes, you've got the exciting, we're locked in, we've got the Silurians making use of their third eye. But for me, the only real problem with the story is the whole Darwin discovers that we aren't evolved from apes in the sense of it didn't happen naturally there was no natural selection there was an unnatural selection and perhaps unnatural selection is a great name for a short trip of some sort that's another story for another time the silurians work on audio and admittedly they probably would have been replaced by a bunch of people who speak in a much more rp fashion but i'd like to see some sort of family trait and the little problems of why didn't they wake up is solved here. The power vacuum and struggles of different factions of Silurians all dealt with here. All of the holes are sewn up because at this point in Big Finish history, A, they didn't know how long they'd go on for and B, sewing things up, joining the dots and making things make more sense was really what they were about. Yes, there's adventure, there's corridors, there's lifts, there's people dealing with technology, there's even God help them, the Merka. I know, the Merka appears in this story. Let's rehabilitate the Merka, bring it back, and say that it's an adult Merka, and there's lights under the water and you don't get to see it. There's a great scene with it attacking. It just works. And I know, it's the Merka. Not good, not good, not impressive, but it's definitely there. So, there are a lot of people out there who don't like the Merka. They think it's the major thing that spoils Warriors of the Deep. For me, the thing that spoils Warriors of the Deep is the ending. There should have been another way. I think there was. But because somebody had left some hexachromite gas lying around, you kind of knew that's where it was going early on. 
not good. But of course, there's nothing like a nice pseudo-historical. So if you like your Silurians, ideal. If, by any chance, you don't like the Sixth Doctor, you're just wrong. I mean, seriously. How, how wrong could you be? It's been wrong for such a long time. If you need a bit of escape from the current political world, then this is ideal. For the sake of 2 dollars you'll own a corking story. And you know what? Problems with evolution, well, it's perfectly acceptable as far as I'm concerned. I mean, after all, I'm the person who wrote, back in the 90s, the very, very early 90s, my first stage play called Real Genesis. Yeah, bear with me. Where a bunch of aliens came to Earth and created mankind as a slave race, and one of them changed their minds. And this was all before I'd even thought about watching this particular story. And to be honest, when I was writing this, and I don't say this very often, I'd gone off Doctor Who. And this shows you how long ago it was. It was about 92, something like that. Ah, the dim and distant past. A place where they do things differently, and latex makeup was even less impressive on stage. But it got the odd standing ovation. And the problem with early success is that you get a taste for it. Not bitter, not twisted, just me. Moving on, this was a great story. I'm going to let you listen to the trailer and decide for yourself what you thought of it. So until next time, when well, I'll probably be talking about Doctor Who and the next episode of 2020 Houndsight where I'll be talking about Neverland. Be seeing you. Doctor Who. Blood Tide. There's something in here. Some sort of lizard, I think. Please, I saw them. The Bible tells us that this world of ours is a mere 6,000 years old. Find lake. Hey, oh, God that the Lord created in six days, that there was but one flood. Devils! With three eyes I saw them. It's about the size and proportions of a man, two arms, two legs. They are here! So to my mind, these fossils should not exist. And now they have come back. Yes. Yes, they have come back. That was the Doctor Who Tin Dog Podcast, available on iTunes, YouTube, Twitter, RSS, Vimeo, and across the internet. Doctor Who and its associated properties are all copyright and trademark of the BBC. No infringement is intended. Why not become a supporter by visiting patreon.com slash tin dog? Contact the show on tin-dog at hotmail.co.uk. The Tin Dog Podcast is a founder member of the Doctor Who Podcast Alliance. 